Welcome to Understanding Photography with Kim Ayres, episode 149. If you're looking to improve your understanding of photography, well, then you're in the right place. Make sure you subscribe, invite your friends. Uh, here, well, here we are live on uh, YouTube. Leave me a comment. Let me know you're here. Let me know where you're from. Let me know what the weather's like. Tell me any, any interesting little facts that are happening in your life just at the moment. Um, now, today we're going to be talking about the idea of ground level photography where you get right down at absolute ground level to take your photos. I'll also be giving feedback on images to um, VG, John and Sandra have all sent me bits and pieces, a uh, few images to take a look at. So we'll be talking about some of that. Um, so yeah, stick around. So yes, and welcome. Um, like I say, leave me a comment. We are here live, or unless you happen to be watching the recorded version, in which case you can still go ahead and subscribe and click the little notification bell so that you know for future episodes. I think it's always a bit more fun if you can join in the live. I can see we've got people in already, and this gives you the chance to join in the chat. They're a friendly bunch. <laughs> Don't be scared off by them. Come and join us. Um, so what have we got here? Oh, VG says, good evening, everyone. April says, hello, everyone, for a cloudy day with the sun trying to come out. It's very springy here. It was summer for a couple of days. Love it. John's joined us and says, hi, Kim. Welcome, John. Glad you could make it along. Nadia says, hi, everyone, from an overcast Fife. Maggie says, hello, from a grey Castle Douglas. And it's true, Castle Douglas is looking a bit grey outside. It says, well, a bit of a dreary day. However, according to the weather forecast, we should be getting a bit of sun later this week. So looking forward to that. Rosemary says, good morning, from a damp and drizzly Washington state, where we are predicted to have cold downpours later. Mm. Meg says, good afternoon, everyone. Roy says, hello, everyone. I'm from a grey Yorkshire. That's looking more like it's grey everywhere else at the moment. Um, Janet says hi from Mrs. Sag Mrs. Auger. Mrs. Auger. Auger. Miss I can never pronounce it. I'm never entirely sure, but I do know it's in Canada. So Janet from Canada says uh, weather has been all over the place this week from minus five degrees C uh, for sunrise last Sunday to plus 30 C on Thursday. Plus, wow, that that's that's an extreme swing. Um, Oh, VG says it's a sultry, hot night in India. Wow. Uh, Rosemary says, yes, this is a wonderfully friendly group. Do come and join any new folks. Stacy joins us also from Hatbro in Pennsylvania. Says, good morning, cloudy, a little warmth. Was very summery. And Robert's joined us from, oh, he's not from, Robert from Texas is saying, howdy all from California. Sunny and mild. <coughs> I think you were in California last week. Obviously having a bit of a time of it. Right, okay, so welcome, yes. So, what I'm going to be talking about today, like I say, we've had uh, VG, John and Sandra have all sent in images with the idea of uh, getting some feedback, helping them move forward with some ideas of their photography. So I'm going to look at that in a little bit. But first of all, I'm going to talk about the ground, ground level photography. And this is ahead of the idea that I'm setting a challenge. I'm setting a challenge for next week, uh, which will be the ground level photo challenge. So what I want you to do is Listen in, have a think about the kind of things I'm saying. Hopefully I will inspire you to have a few ideas to this week, go out there and take some photos yourself at, at ground level. Then what I want you to do is send them in to me, edit them up, pick out your best ones, edit them up, send them in. And um, so you can either uh, go to the Facebook group, if you're on Facebook, we have a Facebook group also called Understanding Photography with Kim Ayers. Leave your images in there. Or if you prefer to email me directly, then straightforwardly kim at kimayers.co.uk is where you can send them. So send me the images. Um, tell me a little bit of background about, about the photo, why you decided to take it, what you like about it. And then next week, we'll, we'll just have a kind of a bit of a celebration. We'll kind of look at and a bit of inspiration. So we'll see every the great thing about something like ground level photography is everybody's going to interpret this slightly differently. And even if you interpret it in the same way, hey, we've got people from all over the world, from different parts of America right through to India and different parts of the UK and, you know, a vast array, uh, range of habitats and localities and what have you, whether you want to go urban or you want to go um, countryside or you want to do, you know, off the, the front door of your house, it doesn't really matter. Um, there's lots to go for. And so hopefully then this will also spark ideas in everybody else. So this idea of, you know, we are a, a, a group, a community 
Um, and we're all hoping to improve our understanding of photography. Seeing how other people respond to the challenge is just as important as our own response to the challenge. So make sure you do take part, not just for yourself, which will help improve your photography, but also to help inspire um, some of the other people watching as well to go out and have fun. Um, <coughs> well, Sandra's joined us and says, hi everyone from a cold and overcast Birmingham. Um, oh, John says, thanks for that. I'm 74 years old. I can get down to ground level. Getting up is the problem. <laughs> well, this is where what you need to do, John, is you need to get a tripod or a monopod, attach the camera and then turn it upside down and lower it down. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's that's I have seen people. Do. It's, oddly enough, I wasn't even going to talk about that today, but it's it is it is one of those things that you can do is you can use a tripod or a monopod to attach your camera and then literally hold it down. And then if you happen to have and it's worth always remembering, because quite a few cameras have um, a little pull out screen so you can, you know, pull out and twist around um, you know, which ways to do this. Yeah, like that. So you can pull the screen out, turn it around. So don't forget, if you've got it that way, you've got it flat down, you can be looking straight down at it. Or if you've got the camera turned up the other way around, you can likewise turn it around and be looking at it that way. So you can, in fact, hold your tripod upside down, have the camera upside down to take the photo, but be glancing down and seeing what it's looking at. Almost like a periscope in some ways. Um, so. This was one of the things I was going to talk about with the idea is that if you are trying to get down to ground level, one of the big problems we quite often have is getting our head. If we're trying to look through the viewfinder, are we getting an earful of dirt or maybe it's not really working? So, um, <clears throat> so if you happen to have one of these flip open screens, flip out screens, then that's a really useful device. OK, let's 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 I'll tell you what, let's go where am I? Um, one to two. Uh, I, there we go. I seem to have lost my folder already. Um, so where are we? Um, pull that over there and go to there and um, remove that. Drag that in and then with luck I ought to be able to see what's going on. Right, okay. So let's find you some examples here. Um, now, so when I talk about the idea of ground level photography Let's, no, not that one. Let me do that one and that one. Yes, I will get there eventually. So <coughs> here's an example. It doesn't actually literally have to be at ground level, but in this case, this is a pier in Whitby in Yorkshire. Uh, Roy should know about this one. So where you're heading out, you know, to in, uh, the far end of the harbour. And uh, so actually we are still a few metres above sea level and you can look through the gaps and see bits of pier and other bits below you. Uh, look over the railings, you see the sea. Um, and here you've got like one of these little kind of guiding in lighthouses so that at night time the, the boats know which part of the harbour to come in. And I was out there and I quite like, I like the way the, 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 the sweep of the, the boards was going around. Now I have other photos of this taken from normal eye level. But if you place, placing the camera down on the ground, kind of gives you know it just gives a different perspective and I find it really it's one of those really interesting ones I think there's a a key point about this is one of the things that um, a lot of us can fall for especially if we um, mostly do say landscape photography or something like that is the problem with landscape photography is it doesn't really tend to matter what height you're at so it never occurs to you to photograph at pretty much anything other than normal standing height so you take everything from normal eye level. And yet, if we're exploring different ideas with our photography, then what we really want to do is be constantly looking to change our angles, not just left and right, but up and down, and not just tilting the camera, but changing our height. Anybody who's ever really got into photographing pets or children, one of the first things you ever need to learn is to get down to their level. And then the photos become much more interesting. Now, but. What if you're not worrying about pets or, or, or children? It can still be a really interesting thing. You can see that when we get down to this level, that sort of sense of the curve, the, the, the move around, can, you know, sort of dramatically changes our, pers our perspective. This is not a perspective we would normally have on this pier unless we happen to have tripped over. <laughs> Although at that point, we probably would be trying to think primarily about how to get up again rather than, oh, this is an interesting angle. Let me pull my camera out. 
<coughs> Although if you have ever done that, tripped over and then thought this is an interesting angle, pull your camera out, kudos to you. Do tell us about it. <laughs> the ultimate photographer. Um, so this is a guy. This is this is a kind of a sense of what you can do with that. Let's show you a few more. Let's show you a couple more photos then. Give you an idea of what we're talking about. Another thing here is where I took the camera um, back during the winter. We had a we were getting frost and bits of snow, and I you put had the macro lens, macro lens on the camera, and just literally went down and sat it in the snow and played around with the focal point, and. Um, and here we go, you know, lovely macro shot of the ice crystals, the snow crystals um, on bits of grass. You know, you can kind of zoom right in here and kind of get some of these wonderful sort of shapes and oh, and and what have you. But <coughs> you can see from the, the, the shards of grass coming up out of the snow and frost. In fact, actually, I think this was frost rather than snow. Um, by the look of it, probably frost on frost. Um, that... You know, you're, you, that again, it's, it's that getting down into the grass level rather than we're kind of we walk across the grass, we trudge across it, we look down at it, get right down into that level. And there's a whole hidden world, there's a massive hidden worlds to kind of play around with. Um, where are we? Uh, what else? Yeah, another thing. I mean, okay, this was so the last couple I've just shown you. Well, well, that last this one's kind of much more winter. Spring, spring is in the air now as well. Um, tulips. This is here's a tulip just starting to push up through the earth. Uh, I took this one last year, and again with the macro lens, and you just get right down to if you've got a garden out into the ground level and um, camera. If if you're worried about getting dirt on your camera, a little mat, a flannel, a cloth, or something like that. Um, if you've got a little rubber mat, even better. Mouse mat. Mouse mats are good. Um, <laughs> Just put that on the ground, place the camera on top of that, and you can be at ground level and you can get... So, I mean, normally with a tulip just starting to poke up through the grass, we wouldn't normally have that kind of, um, you know, we wouldn't normally be looking at it like that. We'd be sort of looking downwards. So this idea then that um, we really want to kind of change, change our angle and get right down, get level with uh, what we can see out of the ground. Um, you can see it's, it's changing our perspective. It, it allows us to see things in a way that we don't normally see them. And I would say that that's probably one of the one of the things that we love about photography. You know, the whole wonder of photography isn't just about capturing something that we recognize. That tends to be more or less the snapshot. The snapshot is a reminder of um, a place we, we've been, you know. So whether that's, you know, uh, Let's do a quick selfie of us in front of this um, place, this uh, tourist spot, or, you know, this memory kind of photography. But when you go beyond memory photography, when you're trying to approach it as a, you know, taking your photography more seriously than just capturing memories, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create shape and form and interest. And, and, and part of the love of photography is the fact that we can capture, we can whether we freeze moments or we, you know, we look for line and form and we see things in a different way. We see things in a way that we don't normally see them. We try and capture them and that's what grabs our interest and that's what kind of tends to keep our interest going in photography uh, at a level that people who just do quick snaps and aren't bothered about pursuing it to the degree that we want to, if you follow what I mean. So, <clears throat> um, oh, there's a couple more comments coming in here. Uh, what have we got? Um, so, oh, oh, Susan's joined us as well. Says, hello, all looking forward to the ground level stuff. Uh, oh, John said, invert the monopod. Brilliant. I'm oh, <laughs> glad you like that one. Um, oh, Anne says, hello, everyone. Joining a bit late. Uh, Roy says, yes, I know Whitby well. Stacey says, April, it was gorgeous. I haven't seen temperatures in the high 80s in April for a while. Uh, this weekend is going to be cooler. Hope everyone enjoyed Easter. Uh, April said, I do like the photo, this photo on ground level. VG says, the curve is beautiful. Uh, Rosemary says, coming to the uh, coming to the boards on the walks, uh, the interesting textures. Uh, sorry, the, it brings the interesting textures to our attention. Cool. Um, VG says, yes, ground level challenge. A uh, little bits of um, icy photo. Lovely Kim. We get wishing we get out the frost. Oh, <laughs> VG saying wishing we got the frost. Um, yes, because for VG, a really cold day is twenty four degrees C. Um, 
Uh, Stacy says it's pretty, but hopefully something to, uh, something on the ground to stay dry. Yes, I mean, obviously, if the ground's going to be wet, you know, maybe you have some kind of mat or something to kneel on as well as putting the camera on. Um, oh, what did we say? Um, yeah, <laughs> Rosemary said she'd mail you some frost. Um, Stacy says, love the tulips rising. And um, Sandra says, reminds me of my allotment in March. So, yes, okay, so this is the thing. So we can get down, we can get low with the camera. Uh, playing around with inverted monopods or tripods, um, sitting the camera on a mat if we don't want to get it right on the grass or we're worry about it, worrying about it getting scuffed on a bit of hard concrete or anything like that. Um, but what I would also say is one of the key things that I've really noticed is actually this is where the phone absolutely comes into its own. I mean, yes, it, like I said, I mean, it's, it's very handy if you've got one of these little flip out backs on your camera, because then you can place it at ground level, you can flip the back up and you can still see what it is you're looking at and you can get your composition right. But sometimes there's a limit to how low you can actually get with, with the camera, because the camera is still kind of, there's a bit of lens off the ground and what have you. Whereas, take one of these, take, take your phone and the, the great thing about the phone is you can get right down you can get under things you can get um you can get right down at ground level very easy and of course the other thing is is you have one of these on you all the time so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to show you a few phone photos which you know taken with this um either this one or my my old phone but just to give you an idea of of, of the fact that this is where this really comes in handy now Again, depending, if, depending on the kind of photo, obviously a phone is never going to be maybe quite as, um, it's going to have quite the, the, the pixel depth or, and clarity that perhaps a good DSLR or mirrorless camera is going to have. But if you're looking for photos to put up online, to put into the online competitions like Photo Crowd, Guru Shots and what have you, these things, they're good enough. Okay, they're good enough. They're, and the other thing is, is, that notion that the best camera is the one that's in your hand, you've nearly always got this on you, okay? And so I think if you're just out for a walk, if you're out anywhere, you can pull this out of your pocket and get down to ground level. It's a really useful one. The challenge isn't about the camera, the challenge is about the picture, okay? So if you can create, get a good picture with your phone, that's what it's about. So sometimes you can you can notice anything i mean um okay let's show you this let's show you a couple more here um here's one i took uh frosted frosted boots <laughs> um i was dropping something off at my uh my stepdaughter's house and as i came out of her door i saw a bike leaning up against the wall i saw a, a, an old pair of boots sitting outside covered in frost and from above, it, it was just very, very cluttered, but I thought I want to get some. So again, just phone down, ground level, took the shot, and it's kind of engaging. There's something a bit more. Now, the colours and light was a bit dull, so I just I uh, converted it to black and white to sort of play more around with the idea of the texture. It was the texture that I was most interested. I love that you can see the texture of the frost um, on the boots and the way it's sort of into, you know, with the laces and, and what have you. And that was really kind of what was grabbing my attention. And so black and white is always, if not always, but quite often, if the colors aren't there, but you've got good texture, black and white is quite a good way to go. But let's show you. Now, for some of you who follow me on Facebook, my personal Facebook account, the last three photos I've actually had up as my banner have been phone photos taken at, at ground level. <clears throat> so this one, when we got a bit of snow, the crocus pushing up through the snow, a little bit of an old cliche, but but there's a there's a across the road um, in Castle Douglas uh, Market Hill. There's a little mound uh, kind of that that rises up, and the snow was there, and there was a, I managed to kind of isolate a crocus. Now again, there would have been crocuses either side of it. I managed to find this one, and by just kind of you can see the horizon line. I'm just we're slightly below the horizon line, and then by using the phone, I was able to get right down, right down, actually at snow level to take this to get to the point whereby the crocus itself is then poking above the horizon. So what we've got here is we're kind of going for that sort of minimalist simplicity: snow, sky and uh, flower. There's not a lot else in there. A little bit of shadow, hint of a tree in the background, a couple of little blades of grass kicking about the place. But mostly this ends up being, it's 
sort of solid, you know, three colours. We've got purple, blue, and we've got white. And there's a beautiful simplicity to that, where when you can just sort of isolate the single flower and have this sort of almost plain kind of background. And extraordinarily simple to do when you've got the phone, like to get down at that level. That actually, oh no, I probably could have done this with the with the DSLR. But I happen to be out for a walk and I happen to have my phone on me. So this was the photo I took. I didn't go out hunting with my camera. So in terms of back to the idea of your phone is a brilliant opportunist kind of photography. Now, some photography, we go out and we hunt. Uh, there's some photography we plan. Um, and then there's the photography we essentially scavenge. <laughs> we come across. Um, and so and so at that point, it's a case of what I... There were plenty of other crocuses about, but I didn't want to have several crocuses in the photo. So I had to move around to get to a point whereby I could just find a single isolated one from a very particular angle to create this photo. On this very same rise, um, a few weeks later, in fact, actually, what was the date? Let's see, this, this one was taken on the 10th of March. So on the 22nd of March, so less than two weeks later, on the same mound, I took this photo. So here we've now got the daffodils have all come up, the crocuses have all died off, the snow's disappeared. Um, in fact, the snow probably disappeared that afternoon, to be honest. Um, but now we've got daffodils are all starting to come out on the rise. So again, we've just got that rise, just kind of breaking the horizon. Again, I'm out, I'm coming back, walking past the same place with my phone, and immediately you can just get down. You can get below the daffodils. You can get underneath them. And because you can get underneath them, you can get the sun behind them. And so we've got all these, this sort of kind of wonderful backlit notion of, um, of the daffodils. So we're getting the light coming through the petals, which is rather beautiful. The other great thing, another great thing to worth mentioning about using your phone is because you're not kind of looking through the lens like you do with your DSLR, it's okay for you to sort of be down at ground level with your phone open, lining it up, looking at the screen as it's pointing at the sun. Because what you should never ever do is look at the sun through the viewfinder on your um, on your camera, through the eyepiece on your camera. Because it's lenses. Lenses are magnifying the power of the sun. You will damage your eyes. You just, you know, never do that. Um, so your health and safety warning, never point to your camera directly at the sun and look at it through the uh, through the eye viewfinder. Now, you can stand back and kind of look look at it through this bit, if you want, from a, from looking back at it, because the most that's going to happen is that goes white. It's not going to act like a torch and, 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 or, or have that same intensity of the sun. And similarly with your camera. Now, I wouldn't recommend pointing either your camera lens or your phone at the sun for long. Leave it for any length of time and you're likely to start frying your sensor as well. But short little bursts and being able to get... And the other great thing about these things is... The fact is the algorithms in the in the programming for your phone is that it is really sophisticated. It draws out all the detail from the shadows for you. Now, OK, the detail isn't fully there. If I start zooming in, we don't have to go in far before we start noticing the um, the artifacts, the pixelating, the um, the ISO. But for a screen level photo for something like, you know, online competitions for web level type photography. These things are just brilliant. They, you know, they, they, that it can balance up a really quite wide dynamic range, especially what we're really talking about is the phones that have been, the, the cameras that have been about for the last couple of years. Um, the dynamic range in them is quite incredible. So I've not had to do very much editing with this one at all. Um, whereas if I'd taken this with my mirrorless camera, um, the in order to get that level of exposure in the sky, the, the, the foreground would have been very, very dark. I would have had to have lifted it out. It would have been high ISO. It would have been noisy. I would have had to do quite a bit of editing to try and make an acceptable photo. So again, back to, you know, I sing the praises of use the phone when you can. Um, OK, let's and then what, what did we do? Uh, what's the next one? The next one was taken on the 7th. So two weeks later or last week. I then took this photo. <coughs> so the dandelions are now coming out as well. Now this is, isn't the same spot, it, but it is only about um, 
30 yards away from that same spot and it actually there's a tree that's running up to the right on the right hand side of this um, and there's a bit of a mound and there was, this was one of the first dandelions I saw starting to poke out of the ground and again great with the foam just drop it straight down I can get underneath the dandelion and so again we've got this brilliant kind of nice powerful straw I've got the sun I've, I've angled the thing so that the sun is directly behind um, the dandelion so that we've got the sun coming through and lighting up so that whole notion of using backlight um, is you know that's kind of where your fun is I think it's it's you know allowing yourself to just kind of get down in amongst and where the light's coming from you can move you can <laughs> you can move around a dandelion or a crocus or some piece of but much more easily sometimes um, and play around with where the light is coming from, which can have a big effect on on your um, on your image. Uh, okay, a couple more comments here. Um, so, okay, VG uh, says, "Oh, ice, ice creams uh, from shop to home become hot creams." <laughs> April says, "Thank you, Kim. I'm glad you are doing this ground challenge. It sounds fun." Uh, Sandra says, "Great capture of the booze. Thank you." Um, April likes the tree on the horizon. I think that would be with the um, the crocus photo. Uh, Stacy says, uh, "Wabis wabi, wabisabi texture of old boots. Love black and white." Rosemary says, "Question, Kim. Do you use your f phone on auto?" I have a really grumbly attitude about the ma manual settings on my phone, so tend not to use the phone camera. Yes, basically. Yeah, I mean, it depends. Sometimes if I'm really, if there's something I'm really wanting to get the control over and the, what I always say with auto settings is a lot of times, especially if you're out on the prowl on the hunt, the, the, your, whether, you know, with your phone, the auto settings nine times out of 10 will do a better job for it, you know, or will get the job done quickly. We'll do what you need it to. The problem is that one time out of 10 or the two times out of 10 when it doesn't, then at that point, knowing how to override and go on and, and to do the manual settings, that's the really useful bit. That's where learning how to do that is, 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 um, will help elevate your photography because sometimes the auto settings auto in the way that you don't want them to. It's a similar thing when we come back to DSLRs or um, uh, mirrorless cameras or whatever. Don't be intimidated by them. If you're just getting your first camera, your first big camera, start off with the auto settings. Again, nine times or eight times out of 10, the auto settings will kind of do what you need them to. These things are designed specifically to help people. If, if they only sold cameras to people who knew how to use manual settings on cameras, they wouldn't sell a fraction of the number. So they have to make the auto settings really sophisticated and they get more sophisticated every single year, every new generation of cameras. Um, use that, use that, get, use the auto settings to get started. Sooner or later, you will come across a point whereby the auto settings aren't doing what you want to, at which point you need to learn the manual settings, learn how to manually override for when you want to have a slower shutter speed or a faster shutter speed, change your priority, or you want to change the priority of where your focal point is or, or your depth of field, or whether you want to go for the higher ISO because it's giving you a particular effect or giving you more freedom to um, have a faster shutter speed or any of these things. It's really useful to learn the manual, but don't feel you've got to learn everything about the manual before you pick up the camera. Get out there and play with it. And even if it doesn't always do what you want, better to take a photo with your phone than not to take any photo at all. You can still use all everything you we, we, we talk about in terms of composition, your rule of thirds, your use of diagonals, your use of leading lines, um, use of symmetry or asymmetry, all these kind of things. Everything we talk about with light, about side light, back light, reflected light, all these things still absolutely apply with your phone. You know, it's about creating a picture and understanding composition and light. Everything we talk about story and narrative, what makes it interesting and what kind of how you get a mood across, all apply with this. The only thing that doesn't really apply with this are the technical levels, which you're more likely to be doing on your DSLR. So, yeah, better you can still practice all your things about composition, story, lighting, everything else can work just as well on your phone. OK, so. I, there are a lot of photographers I know who 
decry the phone, they think it cheapens photography. I don't. I think it's a brilliant, brilliant device that gives you an entrance to photography and allows you to explore photography, explore composition and light. Um, and then you can learn how to use your DSLR as and when you get one, as and when you're ready to. Uh, but it, you don't know, you no longer have to allow, the technology doesn't have to inhibit you, prevent you from being creative. You can be creative now and the technology is helping you do that. Um, so yeah, I would suggest, Rosemary, use the phone, use it on auto. Don't beat yourself up about using it on auto. Only start worrying about the auto if the auto isn't doing what you want it to. Um, Okay, Sandra says, lovely uh, sunny winter day on a great photo. Uh, April says, pretty daffodil shot. Stacy says, daffodils are very pretty from ground level. Meg says, a really lovely colour of yellow daffodils against the blue sky. April says, New York seems to be almost identical to where you live, Kim, regarding the flower schedule. Interesting. <laughs> and Rosemary says, thanks for the input about the manual on the phone. I love my DSLR because the settings are so easy to go through the buttons, but the phone drives me, uh, but the phone requires those awful menu drives. Yeah, I'm... I'm Go along with you there. Oh, Don's joined us. Says, hi, Kim. Sorry, I'm late. It's a bit busy in Northumberland. Great to see you. Glad you could join us, Don. And Janet says, I find my phone screen is hard to see in the bright sun. This is true. You may well run across that problem. Um, <clears throat> it, again, it depends on your phone. The more modern ones, actually, I've found that even with sunlight, what it tends to do is it kind of changes, auto changes the brightness as well. So the screen becomes much brighter. So it's easy. But to be honest, there is always going to be a certain amount of point and guess, I think, if you've kind of got your phone down at a low level but the point is play play get out there and play with it and I think you'll have fun so I mean other examples okay let's 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 show you other things you can do with the phone as well you just um great thing about getting down at a ground level again you know roads um always a bit of fun roads paving this one here again just out from my walk just at the curbside here just placing the phone down um watching a car coming up the way. So you can, you know, I put this on the widescreen setting and you could, you know, that ability to then use, uh, when you get down low, a bit like the, um, the, that shot on the pier that I showed at the beginning, is it sort of really exaggerates. It can really exaggerate that sense of depth, that sense of falling off into the distance. So those kind of where you like to follow the lines of the road or the trees or the telegraph poles or the, or the pavement or anything like that, um, phones could be pretty getting down low can be pretty good fun for that also getting down low now this isn't exactly ground level but um, it was this fantastic uh, I love this old this Jaguar I think it's an XK140 or is it an XK120 actually it says on the badge there oh an XK150 in fact actually yep but beautiful beautiful car but that kind of thing at the front now again yes of course you can do this with your normal camera the great thing about the, the thing is actually there was a car parked just immediately in front. I'm squatted down between the two cars to take this. And again, the great thing about this is it the wide angle lens. <laughs> you can squeeze into spots that I wouldn't be able to get into with my DSLR. Um, so now this isn't strictly speaking ground level, but it's just about that idea of getting down low. That's really what I wanted to say with this one. Or here, the other one you can do because getting down at ground level, that idea of ground level photography reflections puddles right I mean again just out on a walk the other day um, and, and because I was partly thinking about today's um, today's podcast I just thought okay oh look here's a puddle here's a kind of a, so down we, we get that same kind of look that widescreen low level look here but now we've got a puddle the puddles creating reflections reflections of the sky there's like a whole world down within here now you can play with this a bit more I didn't have time I'm just using this as an example but if you had somebody standing if you take out one of your grandchildren or your pet or something like that have that at the other end of the puddle and you're going to get them reflected in it as well. And you can start playing around with that notion of colour and reflection and light. Now, this is what I, do, what I did with this one. I decided to take two versions of this. This one is where, using that rough rule of thirds, so the horizon line here is roughly at a kind of about, you know, a third of the way up from the bottom. But the thing is, you could also just angle it slightly and you put the, the horizon line at the two thirds line. And now we're making much more of the puddle. And then if there happened to be, again, something standing at the end of the puddle, a couple of leaves floating in here, not a huge amount, but sometimes you get interesting bits of debris or whatever floating in the puddle as well. So puddles are a way of allowing you to reflect and get other um, really interesting shots too. 
And then finally, the, the last thing I wanted to talk about with this, some of you may remember back in autumn, um, we we're playing around with the sort of uh, mushroom, toadstools, fungus kind of ideas. And I talked then also about using the phone and getting down low. Um, now, in this case, these ones I didn't use the phone. Oh, um, I did actually use my, my DSLR. But the other thing I was talking about there was the idea of, with this one, what I did was I used, I had a little torch. Um, yeah. Just kind of a little, um, you know, hand, you know, the kind of the hang off your key ring, keychain, um, torch. And I put a little bit of um, a yellow gel, like, you know, you could use a candy wrapper if you wanted, a sweetie wrapper. Or, um, or I had, you know, but you got a little bit of a yellow gel on the side, which I was able to shine. And from this angle, it looks almost like a little shaft of sunlight just sort of bouncing up and coming underneath, underneath the mushroom. Um, and then I did, a, where are we? A similar thing here where I had uh, two light sources and one with a very slight blue. No, it wasn't actually. I just, I had two light. This was an ordinary one and this had a yellow, this one had the yellow gel on it. But then in the color, what I did was I, I blue shifted it slightly in post-production so that you end up with this kind of blue and yellow contrast playing around. But the point is, is that that's this idea of ground level. Mushrooms we're used to looking at from above. When you get down underneath the gills, um, it really is a whole new world, a whole new way of looking at the world. Um, so that's really what I wanted to, to talk about, is, is this notion of ground level, I think, gives us this chance to view the world in a different way. It changes perspectives. Now, whether you want to use your DSLR or your mirrorless camera, or you want to get out with your phone, I think there's a there's entire worlds to explore by just getting down to ground level. And so this then is the challenge for next week. Make sure you get your photos to me, um, hopefully by no later than Friday, Saturday at the absolute latest. Um, but really try and get them to me by Friday, Friday evening if you can. Um, if it certainly don't leave it till next Sunday to send it to me, I won't have time to include them. But Take get out there, you know, like I say, whether it's just off your front step, the porch, uh, the back garden, um, a park across the road, a street, um, a remote road, a, a busy road. Well, obviously, don't put yourself, <laughs> don't put yourself in the way of the traffic um, unless you're maybe on a pedestrian crossing and you can do a very quick, you know, the, the lights have turned red. You can do a very quick kind of dive down to road level, two shots with your, your mobile phone and then rush off again. <coughs> I'm not going to recommend that you you do you sort out your own safety concerns. I I I have no responsibility on that one. However, the point is is that when you get down to ground level, there's a whole bunch of different things you can do. So that's the challenge for next week. Get your photos, edit, find one, find your best one. Um, if you if you don't have a chance to go out, go and raid your raid your archive. See if you've done something like this before. Send me your image for next week, and then next Sunday we'll ha we'll do the uh, the full. Um, challenge uh, vision I'll, I'll go through we'll put the photos up we'll talk through them and we'll see if we can inspire each other to come up with some interesting ideas um, and interpretations right okay so a few more comments here uh where are we um so April says, love the leading lines um, and also love that type of car shot. John says, uh, Kim, are, are phone images JPEGs or RAW? Well, generally speaking, most phone images tend to be automatically JPEG. They're designed for the idea that probably what you're going to do is upload them to your social media. You're, you know, they'll be going up on Facebook or they'll be going up on Instagram. And so they're designed. Now, some phones, some of the more modern phones will also have a RAW option and you might need to go into your menu settings and do that. And if you do that, then you can then save that, transfer it to computer, open it up in camera raw if you've got the, the right kind of editing equipment and then edit it. And that will give you a lot more options than just that the JPEG is the camera's own interpretation of what all the bits should be. Uh, it's not saving all the info. So yeah, if you, some of the modern phones do have a raw option, but you have to go and specifically look them out. But if you do have them, then yes, it gives you options. Um, what else we got? Uh, oh, Stacey says that's a great photo of a car. Should have done that at a car museum two weeks ago. Oh, if you go to car museums, absolutely, just yeah, get down right down in those front kind of grill and headlight shots. I always love those ones. Um, some of the, some cars have really interesting rear 
ends as well with the way the lights are or tail fins and, and things um sandra says loves the puddle shot very effective yeah play around with puddles or if you've had a bit of a wet season or you know a little bit of a downpour it's all sorts of things you can do with playing around with the reflections in puddles especially when you get low um april says second puddle shot makes a real nice photo that's the one from slightly where you change yeah change the horizon line on that whether you're doing lower third or upper third um Rosemary says we've seen some pretty sc scary busy road shots <laughs> and makes this question are you going to have uh, be having colored gels again for future shoots well it all depends Meg on the on the photos that I'm doing the the use of uh, a colored gel um, yeah it depends on the photo uh, generally speaking outdoor shots I don't usually do that I happen to do them for the mushrooms because you know, they were in a dark forest and I was pl and what I was wanting to do was have that sort of sense of a shaft of sunlight coming in so that's where i used it there on studio shooting sometimes i'll use colored gels as well um for something like this a ground level probably not so much usually but um they're just they're, uh, the colored gels are another option for you if you happen to want to play around with lighting uh as a separate you know playing around with off camera off camera lighting right okay so um hopefully then that gives you ideas make sure you get the um the photos into me for next friday either go to the facebook group post your images there or um email me kim at kimairs.co.uk with your images and tell me a little bit about this give me a bit a little bit of story tell me a bit about the photo why you took it what was grabbing your interest in, or any interesting little um, obstacles you had to overcome or people you had to run away from or <laughs> whatever stories are likely to be um, right okay so what we're going to do now then is we're going to move on to the feedback section but just a quick reminder that if you happen to find these podcasts useful interesting entertaining then do consider supporting them with buymeacoffee.com forward slash kim airs uh, Another way you can also help is invite your friends. If you happen to know other photographers who you think might be, enjoy these podcasts or benefit from them, let them know about them and uh, do, do let's grow this community of ours. Right. OK, so <clears throat> feedback time. We've had I've had um, Sandra, VG and um, John have all sent in images. So what I'll do, I'll start with John. And what we've got here is John sent in this picture of a snail shell on top of a, a mound of rock well i'm not sure whether it's rock or a concrete thing but it's with the lichens on it um it's in it's titled top of the world and john said um I, I so i asked him what kind of feedback he was looking for so basically looking to improve my photography so if we take this image i was aiming for a minimalist view did i achieve this i was also conscious of trying for a good composition did i achieve that and lastly, with the title of House on the Hill worked. Yep. Well, titles, I've got a funny feeling we spent a, we, well, a good couple of years ago, but I think we actually did do a podcast where we talked a lot about titles and the use of them. And there are some people for whom titles tend to be one of these things where, well, the thing is, you look at an image and then you give it a title. The title can either reinforce what you're seeing or it can change the meaning of what you're seeing. Um, for some people, there's the idea title. You just shouldn't have the photo ought to stand on its own right. And for other people, the title is a really important part of an image. And if you don't have the title, you're kind of missing half the interpretation. But the title that you give it obviously is um, is going to change your perception of it. So House on the Hill, we're drawing attention to the idea. If, it, if you'd also called it um, an empty house on the hill, then we wouldn't be thinking about this as a, a shell on its own rather than necessarily a shell with a snail in it. We can't actually see a snail in this. Um, you know, so, we, you know, this, it looks like maybe with this one, you've taken, you found a shell, you've placed it on top of rather than this is a snail that's crawled up and happens to be sitting on the top. So it's, it's a kind of interesting one. So I can see what you're getting at. What we have here, we've, we've got the notion of the echo. We've got the curve of the rock. And then we've got the roundness of the shell. And you've gone for a very symmetrical kind of feel to it. And keep it, as you say, keeping it relatively minimalist. All we've got is rock, shell and faded out background. What we also have with this is it's taken on a sunny day and the sun is coming from uh, the kind of upper left if we uh, 
we can see the brighter part is up here and if we follow where the shadow is falling and go opposite direction of the shadow we can tell where the sunlight is coming from and then actually if you really want to play around with and take the angle of the tip of the shadow to the tip of the thing we can even follow the the angle up so you, if you're ever curious about what somebody's doing for a light source you can if you can find a shadow you can generally work out where the light is work coming from if you ever want to repeat it yourself now what i would say with this john first of all actually is i think maybe playing around with the light turn if you'd moved around 90 degrees to the right from as we're looking to this and actually had a backlight um, could have been a slightly more interesting lighting um, generally speaking yes i front light tends to be the least interesting of all the lighting side lighting is like the second most interesting and the backlighting i nearly always now not always, not always but i always tend to think of backlighting as like the photographer's secret weapon look for options for backlighting obviously have to be careful about making sure what everything we said about not getting direct sunlight through your lens into your eye that's got to be but playing around with this it, you often get like a little halo edge or rim lighting on the on on the subject which helps to also separate it out from the background somewhat now the other thing is with this is i think there's a notion of where's the story the story is this shell on top of the the mound but do we need as much of the mound because actually the, the shell by comparison is quite small and i kind of wonder whether this is one of those where you're kind of better off you're getting going to get more of the story by going further in so john sent me the um the raw file so let's just open up that and see what we're actually playing with here and as you can see then what what's also happened from the original he's enhanced the um the contrast and the and the colors and what have you so here we can see then what the original photo is like zoom in it's a very narrow depth of field um in fact actually this is a set of f f4 um iso 125 640th of a second for anybody who's interested so um what might do just for the opt uh, not the optics um detail we just a little bit well don't really actually need the noise reduction um it's, it's, well fine with that but maybe if we click auto that's kind of darkened things down a little bit and then so let's just open this for a moment <clears throat> now what john has done with this one is he's gone for a square crop and then placed this up in the upper third part of that but so it's kind of rule of thirds but it's also it's playing with symmetry um what i can't help but wonder is first of all what, what happens if you go sort of slightly instead of square what if you were to go um landscape i think that starts to create something slightly interesting but actually i find myself just wanting to kind of get in closer and if we come back to this idea of where's the story that actually if we come into something like this we've still got the sense of the roundness of the rock but we now the shell itself is taking up a bit more and i often think that what we're trying to do is we're trying to eliminate the bits that are diluting the story so where else can we go so how far can you go in and still have the story do we do that we still got enough curve there i think we're getting there if we come in too close though if we come to here say then we've lost the story now it's all about the shell we're not really aware of this is just something for it to sit in but if we get to here certainly here we've got quite a lot of the curve here we've still got enough of the curve for it to kind of feel that if you're still talking about top of the world or house on the hill or any of these kind of things that there's enough of a curve here for you to still feel that that's going on now the other thing is what i think is really interesting with this is the notion of the texture the texture is probably more interesting than the colors this isn't the, the there's not enough i mean yeah the colors are okay but they're not really vibrant interesting grab us colors but there is a lot of interesting there's some lovely texture on the in on the on the rock and there's also lovely texture in here and if we're wanting to talk about the idea of enhancing texture potentially black and white is one of these places to go so what i'm going to do i'm just going to duplicate that layer for a moment and then if we go to um filter i'm going to take do this in camera raw 
uh, for quickness. Now, what I'm also going to do, I'm just going to give it a slight vignette, just not much, but just a little bit of darkening the edges in order to make sure that the attention is being drawn into the middle. I'm going to click up here, black and white. So this creates a black and white, but the black and white also gives me a black and white mixer option here. So if I want to take something like the lichens, um, which were sort of slightly yellowish or something. Oh, no, I've grabbed all of the green there. Yellow, that's what I'm wanting. See, we can brighten up or darken down the yellows. And maybe actually if I darken down those yellows a little bit, um, that creates just fractionally more texture. Like play around with the greens. What have we got? Oranges. Now, it's, the oranges are starting to come into play with a shell here as well. Maybe darken that down a bit and we get a little bit more texture coming into the shell here. And I can zoom in a bit here. You can see how that's sort of changing that. And I quite like the fact that some of these stripes get a bit dark. So now we've got this, what we might also do is if we go back into the basic is play around with the actual, well, not just actually texture, maybe clarity, contrast. Let's play with a let's zoom out a bit. Take the highlights down, bring the shadows up, but then play with the contrast a bit more. But actually the clarity tool, clarity tool, I think is maybe creating something interesting here. Shadows up a little bit more. Clarity up a bit more texture, something like that. Um, and now what we can see is we've got this shell and we've got this, uh, and it's sitting on the rock. And I think what, as well as the shell on the rock, what we're really aware of is the texture. The color isn't distracting us from the fact that there's these wonderful textures going on. So I think really when it comes down to it, John, I think there's 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 different potential there. There's there's different kind of ways you can go about it. And I think your um, your your picture on its own feels I can see where you're going. I can see what you're trying to do. But I think it, it's you can get in closer and still have the story now. Obviously, the more of the image we're cropping out, the less information you've got less left in it. So in an ideal world, when you're taking that photo, actually kind of go more macro. Just, just get clo as close to it as you can, depending on how close your lens will allow you to. Um, but uh, yeah, I think really it's the texture is the way to go. And if you were back at something like that, the other option is to, like I say, move around, change the angle a bit and see what it looks like with a bit of backlight or even a sort of 45 degree backlight. I think you might find it really quite interesting lines and texture with that as well. So hope that gives you some ideas, but thanks very much for sending that one in, John. Um, okay, a couple more comments here. Uh, what are, oh, John says it's on a bollard, fair enough. Don says, like your picture, John. Uh, Rosemary says, John, you've got a leg up on next week's challenge. <laughs> uh, Nadia says, I like this picture. Uh, VG says um, this is good for ground level challenge, although it's on a bollard, so it's not strictly speaking ground level, although it has that same kind of feel. This is true. Um, April says I like the blur in the front and then the clarity with the shell. Nice shot. So, yeah, getting the, the right focused in the right place on, on a narrow depth of focus is good. Um, Sandra says textures on the bollard are interesting. John says liking angles are often overlooked in my photography. Yeah, I think it's one of those things that we get used to the idea of photographing what's in front of us. And it's because I do a lot of studio photography as well, where I'm playing around with light, I'm very, very aware of just how much difference it makes on the angle that you, 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 you come at with light and what difference light makes. I've got various podcasts in the past where I've specifically looked at backlighting and side lighting. You can find them in the um, archives. Having said that, they, they are subjects I keep returning to. So if you carry on watching, these things will become clearer. But yeah. That notion, play around with the direction of the light if you can. Um, uh, where are we? Uh, oh, April says that it's fantastic in black and white. John says love the mono. Rosemary says I like the black and white. Removes the distracting colour of the lichens. And Nadia says I like the black and white too. Excellent. Oh, well, I'm glad that was a success then. <laughs> All right. Okay. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to move on to Sandra. Now, Sandra sent through two different photos with essentially the same problem. Um, so let me just show you here what we've what she's what she said. So uh, this is the unedited. This was the edited version. So here we have pink flower, lots of pink flowers in the background. And then this one, uh, that's the edited version, the unedited version. Uh, we've got a yellow flower with lots of yellow flowers in the background. So and what we've got is we focus. It's been focused so that we've got the one flower that's in focus and the rest of the flowers that are slightly out of focus. However, are they out of focus enough? And this is 
kind of what we're seeing is the problem here is that the flower is getting lost it's not standing out enough this this one here stands out but is it standing out enough so to go back to what Sandra said so Sandra's comment was I'm a keen gardener and I love flowers I particularly like photographing them in their natural environment However, in comparison to flowers photographed against a black background, the outside photographs don't do very well. I attached a couple of before and after photos, none of which have done very well in competitions. Now, I know this might be down to the flowers with a black back, that flowers with a black background are more dramatic, or is there anything I, that I can improve? Can you take a look and let me know what you think? <clears throat> so, the notion then of if you've got a flower, the eye, you, could, you can isolate it by maybe if you've got a black piece of card um, and you've got a, a handy helper, <laughs> um, your nephew, your granddaughter, whatever, can stand there with it or you can prop it up on a chair or something or a piece of board or something, place a black piece of board behind the flower you want and you can isolate it out. However, that, that, that's you kind of creating a sort of hybrid studio natural environment situation. But what you're wanting to do is try and take a picture of the flower in amongst the other flowers. There's something rather lovely about the idea of the echoes, that it's not just an isolated flower on, the other, on, the, on itself, but there are other flowers involved as well. However, the problem is, is that the background has become so busy that it's not standing out enough. And this is what we often have a problem. When we have a subject, and it's specifically, particularly when you've got something like a flower, but this applies to so much photography, is there's a subject and how do we isolate the subject from a busy background? And essentially you have a number of um, tools at your disposal. One of them, which is what you've started here, is the idea of your depth of field. So if you can get the, uh, the, the subject you want sharp and everything else blurry, then the, the background becomes blurrier. You manage to isolate your subject that way. Another one, piece of black card, literally isolating it from everything else. Another one is the use of light and dark. If you've got a lighter area, which, so there's more light on the flower that you're wanting in focus and there's less light elsewhere, then the eye will get drawn to the lighter part of the flower. So there's that way of doing it. There's color contrast. If the flower that you happen to be photographing is one color or one tone of, of a particular shade and the, and the background is a different tone or a different color, that in turn can also then um, affect the, the how much it stands out. Now, you've taken the photo in camera, what can you do after? So you, you get, now, if you're wanting to isolate the, the picture, part of the problem then is that you need to, you need to mask, mask it. And when you've got something like this, this is a very, very hard, you know, detailed edge. The idea of actually being able to select and mask out just this flower will be extraordinarily difficult. Um, so sometimes there's ones that you're working with that might be easier or not. Let's tell you what, let's go for this one. So um, let's, here's your original photo. Let's open this one in Photoshop and we might be able to isolate this flower a little bit more. So what we, okay, first of all, let's just kind of crop this down. We'll do that kind of, which are roughly what you did before, kind of rough kind of rule of thirds-ish type thing uh, so that we've got the other uh, what do we do I want to fancy a little bit more of that in there um, maybe. so yeah we'll, we'll go with something like that I'm not going to worry too much at this point but we do have this problem of isolating this flower I'm going to duplicate that layer just in, because I can't remember what it is I'm going to do next so what we can do is I'm going to take uh, a little masking tool here and that's quite good at isolating these bits here and that's, this is doing really well. Now, if I come up here, now it's starting to isolate part of, um, starting to select, but because it's, it's out of focus here, it's not really telling where the end of the flower is. I'm gonna hold down my Alt or Alt key here and just try and sort of bring it in. Uh, this is gonna be, you know, okay, Shift key to try and add that back on. Um, I wanna get that bit. Yeah. It's a tricky one, this to try and get, I'm, I'm gonna go with that for the moment. Um, and then what we also of course want to do as well is we'll just get that stem as well. So I hold down the shift key so that I can add on a little bit more, get get a bit of stem in there. Now, if you're gonna do this uh, yourself, you'll obviously need to take a little bit more time with this. 
But the point is, is now what we have is we've kind of got um, a flower. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, now there's a number of different things here. I can mask it um, and or I can copy and paste it and place it down on top of another one. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to mask this. So essentially, if I was to remove the thing behind, we've just got the flower here. So what is what that's going to allow me to do? If I go down to the layer below and duplicate that layer, if I now blur that layer more, so if I go to filter, blur, Gaussian or Gaussian blur, um, I can... Now, if I blur it a lot, you can see we've got this. Um, this is now standing out a lot more. But we can also see that the edging isn't that brilliant. Um, kind of got to be careful here, you know, that we've got a sharp line here. So you, it, that's to do with your masking. You might have to go in and play around with your pixels a little bit more to, to get the edge as you want it. The, the more blur you do, the more that edge becomes noticeable. Um, so we've got things like So maybe... We need what we can do is just sort of up the blur level a bit, and we're sort of playing around a little bit. So we're just trying to enhance what's there, but without getting to a point whereby it's. Um, now another thing you can do, just what I said, was about the difference between say light and dark. So if I take a curves level and I place it between this top one and the level, and I drag that down, you can see it makes everything else darker, or we make everything else lighter. But let's say we just Again, if I make it too dark, it just looks kind of wrong. So we just nudge it down a little bit, okay? Just just enough to kind of make this bit stand out a little bit more. Another option, <coughs> excuse me, is the notion of color. If I go to hue saturation and I desaturate the background, now we end up with that selective color, which personally I hate. <laughs> now. It's not to say that we do that all the time, but if I just nudge nudge that down a little touch, so we just, we just sort of desaturate, that's too far, that's back up a little bit. So we, we, we're playing with the judgment here. So it still needs to look fairly natural, but without going too far. So some of these are a lot very subtle, you're playing around with them and you might come back and then change them all again later. So let's pull this out again for the moment. And now what I'll do is I will, um, Let's group those three together, just so that what we can do then is see the difference between your original photo and this version of the photo. Now we've got this version of the photo, we can see that this, this flower, the, the, your central flower, is standing out that much more. That what we've done is we've increased the amount of um, blurriness of the background a little bit. We've darkened it slightly so that the flower itself stands out and we've desaturated it slightly so that the vibrancy of the yellow stands out. Now that we've got all these, we'll do just a quick levels check. No, we're, we're fine for levels, that's okay. Um, now we've got these. Now, if you want, you can then kind of go in and play a bit more, do maybe a little bit of vignetting, do a bit of clarity, or maybe just what we can also do is even sharpen this bit up itself as well. So that if I, um, let's just duplicate that layer for a moment. And if I go to, if we go to camera raw filter, um, just on this bit, and then um, play with the clarity a little bit, maybe a little bit of texture, something like that, make that stand out a touch more. Um, so just to show you, we're just sharpening it up a little bit. So we're sharpening this a touch more, as well as having blurred out the other ones. So. Hopefully then, Sandra, that kind of gives you the idea the, the, what you're working with is the in order to make the flower you want to stand out, you have to make sure that there's as much difference, that there's, there's sufficient level of difference between the subject you've got and the background. And if the background's particularly busy, what can you do to unbusy it as such and and make separation? So separation can happen with your depth of folk, depth of field, the amount of blurriness that the background falls into. You can also make it uh, by color changes. You can make it by light and dark changes. Um, all these kind of things are, are tools at your disposal if you if you're struggling at the time and you you know what you can do is in post production. But also there's another thing which is if you the more you zoom in, 
the, 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 the narrower your depth of field becomes with the same lens. So an F5, if you've got a zoom lens and f5.6 gives you a deeper depth of focus when you're pulled out and a narrower depth of focus when you're zoomed in. So if you're going to something like an f2 or an f3, you're got a quite wide aperture, you're better off standing slightly further back and zooming in on the subject than you are being closer up and pulling out. So stand further back, zoom in more, and then that will create a greater depth of field um, and a greater kind of, sorry, a narrow narrower depth of field, a greater sense of blur and outer focus than bokeh of the, the background. So, um, hope, yeah, where are we? Yeah, hope that gives you a few ideas there, Sandra. Uh, but yeah, thanks for sending that one in. I think that's a kind of common, common problem that we often face. Uh, where are we? So, a couple more comments here. Um, Oh, Rosemary says the tweaks on the background really do help the main yellow flower stand out all without looking too edited and April says Sandra I love the flower photography too, uh, too. Um, I do exactly what you do thanks Kim for your tips excellent okay <clears throat> last one I'm going to talk about now is VG um, which also has some kind of cut out things going on here it's a slightly different problem though uh, VG also sent in two photos with essentially the same problem <clears throat> Um, so we'll talk through these and then I'll do a quick reminder of the um, the challenge again at the end. So for, for now though, let's go to VG's photos. So VG sent me two photos. She sent me this one and she sent me this one. So what we've got here is we've got what looked like essentially metal sculptures on the wall. This one's been converted to black and white. This one's in color. And VG says, um, Attached a couple of photos for critique. Both were taken on the wall of a restaurant. The lighting was not good enough. Uh, sorry, the lighting was not enough while both uh, the wall, hanging, wall hangings looked good. When I aimed my mobile to take a shot, they looked a bit dull, maybe because of the background. The uh, this, uh, this time the question is more on editing. Uh, how to make them look vibrant and will changing the background work? When I tried separating the background in Photoshop, as there were shadows, it was difficult. Masking proved... Uh, two to prove to be difficult is it, and it would not come out perfect. The shadows were important. I don't want to miss them out. Please let me know how to change the background. So yeah, 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 yeah. We're into a major problem here that actually, if you were wanting to change the background, we would have to cut out the shape here. And cutting out this shape, as you can see, is incredibly detailed and it's not, it's a difficult one. Um, so if let's open this in Photoshop and what we find here then is if I and if I use the you know the auto thing here and start um, it's okay so it's grabbing grabbing some of it but you can see here it's grabbed some of the shadows and then what it hasn't done is it hasn't grabbed the inside either so maybe I, I change my selection let's undo that uh, where are we sorry history let's come back to here maybe what I want to do is I'll try the if I try the selection option, which is the magic wand tool, where it selects a color range. And we can see here that, oh, okay, that's, I hold down the shift button, try and get a bit more. I kind of come into here. It's not really liking it. I try to get into bits here. It's, that's okay. Where's take off contiguous? That should collect, select anything in that color range, except for the fact that it's struggling with where the shadows are. And you know, the more bits of wall we manage to get, the more chunks of shadow it gets as well. So we, we are ending up with problems of the fact that because we've got this kind of shading going across, is knowing exact is that the, the, we can see quite clearly that the darkness of the wall is moving across and, but it's not it obviously being able to tell the difference between this bit of leaf and this bit of wall which because the, that leaf and that bit of wall there are actually fairly similar shades. So despite the fact that I can see it and don't, no matter how sophisticated Photoshop selection procedures have gone, and they are pretty so damn sophisticated, is it's not doing what we want it to. So I'll deselect de that. So other ways we can play with this, let me just duplicate that there again. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to channels. And if we look at the red, the green and the blue, where what we're trying to do here is find a bit of contrast. So let's, if I go to that red, notice on the red channel here that if it looks like there's more contrast between the edging here in black and white. 
So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to select copy and then come back to the layers and paste that. So we now have a black and white version on here. Now, there are quicker ways of doing this. I've Unfortunately, at the moment, I have to say I've forgotten there are other ways of turning this into a mask. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take the 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 burn. You've got the burn tool and the high and the 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 dodge tool, right? So I'm going to take the dodge tool, right? Now that and I'm going to put it on highlights. Now what that allows me to do is start lightening up a bit. But I'm going to let's I'm going to exaggerate. Let's take this up to I'm going to take that up to a level of about twenty ish. I'd say about that's twenty two. And if I start putting this on here, we can see that it starts. What it's doing is it's lightening the highlights, but it leaves the shadows alone. And if I do that, suddenly there's much more contrast. And I can just come in and touch that up a little bit here. I've got to be careful because I will start losing it there. So I'm just going to try to lighten this up a little bit round here. And now what we can see is there's much more contrast between the light and the dark area. OK. Um, now we've got that. What I can do is I can make a mask from this. Now, there are a number of ways of doing this, but the, just a very quick one here. I'm going to go to if I select color range. And I select the white. Now, if I select the black, I select the grey. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the white. OK. And you can sort of change this up where you lose bits and you can drag it down where you keep it a bit more. But you can see some of the bottom comes in here. So you kind of get to a point. We're just trying to get rid of that little bit there. And so somewhere anyway, somewhere around there. And now I'm going to click OK. And now what we've done is this selected all the white. And if I then create a mask, what it's done now is it's masked all the, the white um, and it's allowed the, actually, is that what I wanted to do? Let me just take that off a moment and take that mask there. So I've masked this the wrong way around. Yep. So let me come back here for a sec. I will hold down the Alt key and I'm going to click mask. So. What I then do is I drag this down to the layer below. And what we can see is we've now got this with no background. So if in between these layers I decide to stick a background in and let's say I decide to do red and we'll just fill a red background. We've now got now right, that's pretty disgusting. <laughs> well overpowering. So let's say well, let's go for a yellow. Let's go for a pale. It's you know, not kind of green yellow, kind of warm yellow, something like that. Um, fill that in and that becomes quite interesting in its own right. So what you can see now is we have our texture. We've got a, we've got our, our separated out um, sculpture with the shadow, which we then managed to place on top of a different kind of background. Now, to say if we wanted to, we could take an even different kind of background. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to open an old photo of VG's from a couple of years ago, which I always loved which was this one of the textured wall um, and, the, and the small water pump. Now, if, if what I do is, um, where are we? Uh, uh, just go to rectangular market. So I'm going to copy that, paste that on here and just drag that out, something like that. So we've now got this textured wall, which is placed between. You can see then that we have now it looks like this this shadow is happening on the wall. So that then is one of the ways you can do it. Um, so to, to recap with this then VG, that what we did was when we had our original um, image here, the problem with selection was that the auto selection wasn't wanting to do it. But by going to the channels and changing it to the red channel, it created more of a distinctive thing, uh, separation. And then we used the the dodge tool to whiten up the greys, the pale greys here, and just get the highlights, which allowed anything that wasn't white or very light to sort of to, to stay. We then mucked around, changed that to a mask, a masked version, um, and then we were able to reapply that mask to the other layer so that it could keep the original in, and then that gives you the background. So I hope that makes sense, VG. Um, 
There's similarly, just if I just quickly uh, open this one. Um, now, this one, because it's got a hard edge, probably. Well, I don't know why it's saying OBS disconnected and reconnected. I desperately hope <laughs> I haven't lost you there. Um, so, what we can see is that it has, in fact, selected this bit around here. So, now if I select uh select let's say select the inverse um and mask it we've now got this so let me duplicate that layer for a moment and what we can do with this layer then again if we create a layer underneath have i just done this the wrong way around again let me just yep though no, there we go we can create a, a now, the thing is, we've got all these bits in between. What we can do is change our interaction. So if we do darken or multiply, multiply is quite good, color burn, then what it does, so something like darken is it's only allowing the darker shades to show up. So the lighter shades like the white don't, although they have gone gray here. But if we do multiply, it then interacts with what's below. And again, if we were to say, take your texture from here, let's just duplicate that layer across to um, our other one. Um, oh no, yeah, it's VG1, so okay. Let's just copy that, paste it here, right, and then just drag that underneath. You can now see that we've actually managed to get this to sort of be sitting over the top of your textured wall. Um, so again, we can just play around with the, the different interactions of the layers, and you can get some really quite interesting patterns. I mean, that looks more like it's scratched into the, the wall, um, even through the exclusions and divides and, and what have you. But by and large, something like multiply is probably a good place to start with something like that. So hopefully then, VG, that gives you a couple of ideas for uh, cutting out. Right, a um, few more comments here. Where are we? Uh, um, uh, right, that was a shadow. Yeah, okay. So April says shadows are cool. Sandra says thanks, Kim. That was really helpful. Will get help me to get better photos when I'm doing outdoor flower photography. Well, I'm glad that's useful. Um, Sandra says uh, also says oh yeah. So Sandra's now chatting to April. Robert says amazing techniques. So I'm going to use that. April says beautiful uh, with the background of your old photo. Um, Fiji says the background looks good now. And John says fascinating techniques, Kim. Excellent. And um, Fiji says dodge works good too. Excellent. Um, oh yeah, Sandra says the textures uh, bring out the detail and make for some great photos. Great. Well, okay. Well, thank you very much to uh, Sandra, to John, and to BG for sending in the images. Um, I hope everybody else found those techniques useful as well. So don't forget now, next week, next week is the ground level challenge. If you happen to have tuned in late and you missed all the beginning, when this comes to an end, go back to the beginning where I talk all about showing you examples and what we're up against. So I really encourage you to join in the ground level challenge. Get out there with your camera, get out there with your phone, get down low, see what you can find. I'm absolutely, I, I guarantee you will find it fascinating. And then put together a photo, put together your best one. Um, it doesn't have to be an award winning photo. It just has to be something that you've enjoyed taking and you feel it has some merit on some level, then send it to me, send it, either email it to me or give it, put it in the Facebook group, Understanding Photography with Kim Ayers. Get it to me by next Friday, um, Saturday at the absolute latest, but if you can do it for Friday or before, that will be even better. And then next Sunday, we will look at the, um, the challenge and, um, and see what people have sent in and enjoy um, the creativity and the eye that everybody, uh, different eyes that people are, are using, um, the different aesthetics and angles that people will come at it from. Because we all look at, we all look through the camera in a different way. We're all hunting out different things. So it will be fascinating. Do send me through your imagery. Meanwhile, if you found these uh, podcasts useful, interesting, or entertaining, then do consider supporting them with buymeacoffee.com forward slash Kim Ayers. And of course, don't forget to subscribe and make sure you invite your friends along as well. Right, that's it. Uh, that's us. A um, uh, couple of last comments there. Of, uh, April saying have a great weekend, everybody. And yes, I hope you do enjoy uh, the rest of your weekend. I need to now muck around and find out which button I'm supposed to press. That one will do. Take care. Hope you take uh, in, in join us for next week. And do 
do well for it. Take care. Bye-bye.